thank you everybody for coming. Um, oh yeah, it's here, oh, great, sorry about that. Uh, Hydrologic Systems is actually a company that's been around for a while and we really started out in the industrial sector and I'm going to get there to a moment. Uh, we have two locations, um, one in Hawaii and one in California. Um, as you see, I'm the CEO and Chief Science Officer of Hydrologic Grease Reduction Systems. We also have a research and development company in Hawaii on the Big Island. The reason we are on the Big Island to do water research is the Big Island, as may, you may or may not know, from the 13 climate zones actually has 11 of them. So it helps us actually, we can jump in our car and just go over and drive about 20 minutes and be in a completely different climate zone. We also took this, and I'm going to speak more or less specifically about this technology being used in grease interceptors and grease traps, but this technology we're currently deploying in um, septic system and cesspools. And on the Big Island of Hawaii, there's actually no sewer infrastructure per se, so it's a really good test bed. So we have a lot of research that we're doing over there, and here in California, we're actually uh, deploying these grease systems in, uh, uh, on 22 sites so far in California alone. Uh, fairly large size interceptors, up to 12,000 gallons, uh, and I'm gonna get to that in a moment too. With me also is uh, Milton Burgess, he's in the audience, and I'm gonna involve him a little bit if there's any questions and answers. Um, he's actually uh, the president of Green Tech Inc. and he is uh, one of our partners that early on came on and distributing this and helping us to build this all up in San Diego initial, initially. So thank you, Milt, for being here. Um, all this technology that, that I'm going to show you really started out what we did uh, about 20 years ago. This is in Hamburg, Germany. We really started out with soil cleaning. Uh, there was a great need to decontaminate soil. And um, so what we really started out with is we had a uh, truck, basically a dumpster truck that we highly modified. Uh, we put some surfactants in it, we put some air in it, we washed the soil for about a half an hour, then we went into a couple of these uh, retention basins, and then basically we, here you see sort of the first um, bioreactors that we built for this, because what we found out is that we can make an emulsion, the emulsion is all stable, but um, you can't really discharge it because it looks brown, it looks ugly, and there's a, there's a perception from a PR standpoint because you just washed soil, the water is brown, but when you put it into uh, a little river uh, or a lake, then it looks dirty. So we basically came up with the system called a fixed bed bioreactor where we really wanted to rapidly um, uh, bioremediate the emulsion. And so that's really where the bioreactor technology came from. Uh, we built some very large systems, like this one is actually for Tyson Food and Research in uh, Springdale, Arkansas, where we're basically running their entire process system. This does about 70,000 gallons. So this is sort of the background that everybody understands that this technology came from an industrial application down to a restaurant and grease application, so not the other way around. We were then ultimately asked to design actually a system for restaurants but we couldn't quite figure out uh, the price point because these large reactors were much, much more expensive and we were asked to design actually something in the five to $10,000 range. Uh, that was quite a challenge. Also, when we got into this designing the system about nine years ago, um, we, we first said like, well, how big is the grease problem? Uh, you know, nobody seemed, seemed to know much about it. Um, and even today, I would say that the precise functions of a grease interceptor are really somewhat of a mystery. Grease interceptors were invented actually before the light bulb was invented, and their design fundamentally never really changed, and you can sure see that the kitchen and the way a kitchen runs changed significantly since the introduction of a light bulb. So we have now complex surfactants, we have surfactants that are biodegradable, they change the dynamic, we have dishwashers, all this stuff. So there's a lot of, it's not an easy answer, and it's actually quite a complex thing. So what we did is we looked, there's some data here for the city of Raleigh that says 61% of the loading in a sewer plant is actually from Greece. Uh, EPA actually uh, estimated to be almost 80%. And uh, when you really start adding the fact that the grease in an interceptor is mainly responsible for hydrogen sulfide, uh, production, it basically produces hydrogen sulfide gas, then you're really going to come up and say almost 85% of it is a problem. 
that could be related to Greece. We're also looking now, there's a lot of data that shows that larger Greece interceptors aren't necessarily better because they go anaerobic. And when they go anaerobic, you do have the problem that they generate a lot of hydrogen gas, so it's gonna start eating your, your piping and so forth. Uh, so we've been looking uh, at a lot of data, uh, the longevity of Greece interceptors and how can you change it. So bigger isn't necessarily better in Greece interceptors. So we knew it was a big problem. We knew it was a huge market uh, that really may remained completely unaddressed, more or less. So how do you get rid of the grease? Well, you know, you can pump it, you can move it, and then you can landfill it, or you can put it in a wastewater treatment plant. And then what you can do is really, in a wastewater treatment plant, it's just sort of a stop. It ends up in, uh, really in the landfill anyway. It's just like goes through the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, there's a yellow grease and the brown grease. The yellow grease gets turned into biodiesel. That's basically your fryer oil and so forth. The brown grease that sits in the interceptor uh, really isn't. There's a lot of companies that claim, but the city of San Francisco just got a million, was it a million dollar uh, uh, grant from the Department of Energy trying to figure out how to do that. And there's really too much stuff in there. It's really like uh, there's no consistency. You don't know what they did in the kitchen. You don't know what food they had. You don't know a lot of things when you superheat it, which you have to do to separate them. You got the fatty acids, they'll eat your infrastructure, they'll eat just about anything. So it's a very expensive process. And at the end of the day, for the consumer, or the customer, uh, he still has the same set of problems. So I'm going real quick. Uh, so the other way that you could do it is bioremediation. So bioremediation in grease traps has been tried many times. There's a couple of issues with it, uh, especially in interceptors, which are much larger. There is really, as far as we know, no cost-effective solution for grease interceptors. There's a couple of very interesting ones for grease traps out there. That, that uh, one in particular is really the next presenter, by the way. Uh, enzymes alone fail. You hear a lot about enzymes. Enzymes, you could do it with enzymes that run you about $350 a month in enzymes alone if you buy them from Nova Nordisk, and it's still going to be an issue. Usually enzymes, the problem that you have is that it recongeals down the, 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 the sewer and, and they really reform. And uh, a lot of, of cities and, and counties actually just forbid enzymes altogether. 